Hi, I'm Sam Hawley, coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people. This is ABC News Daily. For more than 10 days, the women of Iran have been risking their lives by defying the country's strict dress code. In cities across the country, they've taken to the streets, burning their headscarves in protest against the death of a young woman after she allegedly violated the hijab mandate. Today, Iranian-American journalist Nagar Matazavi on the brutal and deadly crackdown that's now underway. Nagar, we're hearing sounds from Radio Liberty. It's the sounds in a hospital room where 22-year-old Massa Amini was being treated. What was she being treated for? Well, the circumstances of Massa Amini's death are still unclear. Mm. We see her lying on the hospital bed. There have been doctors on social media weighing in, saying that they see visible bruises or signs of violence. Her family says that she was a healthy young woman. She was just 22 years old. The state is still maintaining that she had an underlying health condition and that she had a heart attack and suddenly collapsed. But regardless of what exactly the circumstances of the death was or what moment led to the death, what's important is that she died in police custody. Mm, Okay, I want you to take me back to that day when she was arrested on September the 13th. So Masa Amini was an average small-town girl from the Kurdish region in western Iran who had visited, who had travelled to Tehran. Apparently she was on the metro and she gets off with her brother when the morality police stops her for the way she was dressed, not finding it Islamic or appropriate enough. And then they detain her and they take her to a detention centre. They even published a video of her walking around in the detention center and the video is edited so we don't know exactly what happened during the entirety of the time especially the time of her arrest where her family says that she was subjected to violence and then hours later she ends up in a hospital in a coma and then eventually dies you mentioned the morality police Who are they and why did they deem her to be dressed inappropriately? So the morality police, Gashta Ershad, or literally the guidance patrol, is tasked, as the state says, supposedly with guiding women, quote-unquote, guiding them and teaching them or um, basically suggesting how they're supposed to be dressed according to the mandatory hijab laws in Iran. So according to Iranian law, hijab is mandatory for women. And then these forces, because they're part of the larger police, they have the authority to arrest women and to basically resort to violence to enforce this guidance. Over the years also, this guidance has become so so subjective that it's it's almost unclear why and who gets stopped, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, because women have been pushing the limits of what is acceptable. The state has been trying since after the, the Islamic Revolution, the 1980s has been trying to dictate this very strict dress code on women. It used to be Dark colors, solid colors, very long robes, covering the entire hair, only the face showing in the 1980s. But then women slowly refused this guidance or this mandatory dress code and they pushed the limits. And now you're at a point that after Masa Amini's death, we've seen videos of her in the detention center. And you have even some religious Irania, some hijabi women asking what exactly was wrong with the way Masa Amini was dressed. She looked like a normal dress woman. She actually had a pretty long manteau or cover up as we call it in Iran. She had a long scarf or like a shawl around her hair. There was a little bit of hair showing, but that's just the normal woman you see on the streets of not just Tehran, but even small towns across Iran these days. This could have happened to any of us. Okay, 
Okay, so let's talk now about these growing number of protests on the streets since the death of Massa Amini. What are women doing and what are they saying? Just describe the scenes for me. There was an outpouring of anger. It first started from social media and the national conversations, but then it poured into the streets. And it is the death of Masa Amini, but I want to emphasize it's also years and years and layers of layers of anger that women have individually been fighting with this morality police, resisting this quote unquote guidance um, over the years. And then essentially it turned into a collective uh, pushback, this outpouring of anger, women throwing their scarves in the bonfire, dancing around bonfire with their hair showing without the hijab and essentially in a symbolic way showing that enough is enough and that they don't want this mandatory hijab and this dictating of a way of not just dressing but also a way of life by the state. So they, they don't want to cover up anymore. They don't know. It's. Uh, I want to emphasize it's women and men, but we also mm. see a very strong presence and leading by women. And it's incredible because essentially it, the spark was a women's rights issue, women striving f- to be treated like equal citizens with dignity. But men also are shoulder to shoulder with them because the anger is also directed at the entire state and the ruling class. And it's something that men also share with men, with women equally. Mm. It must be so incredibly dangerous for those people protesting. It definitely is. So Mm. we're hearing more and more of reports of people being killed, protesters being killed on the streets. It's still unconfirmed. The numbers are coming more. So far, it seems like dozens have been killed. Mm. Many of people, they are getting killed in the middle of the streets in Iran. Thousands have joined anti-government demonstrations throughout the country over the past 11 days. Security forces have responded at times with live ammunition. And as we've seen in previous protests, and now we're also still seeing images of the security forces, a lot of brutal violence against the protesters on the street, shooting directly at protesters. And uh, we saw a similar situation in November 2019 also when there was a sudden hike in fuel prices and people took to the streets. The state eventually brought the iron fist down and killed hundreds of protesters on the street. Thousands were arrested. Mm. A number of Iranian demonstrators blocked a road. The State Department has received videos of what happened next. Between the rounds of machine gun fire, the screams of the victims can be heard. In this one incident alone, the regime murdered as many as 100 Iranians and possibly more. We have seen reports of many hundreds more killed in and around Tehran. The grievances, though, didn't go away. So it's layers of anger and grievances that are not addressed by the state. They just pile up every time there's a protest, if it's an economic issue, if it's political, if it's social, and in this in this essence, essentially a basic right. But it's also piling up on layers of accumulated anger from past protests that haven't been addressed. You mentioned the protests in the past, 2019, we saw them in 2009, and the crackdown was so severe. Now there's a new president in Iran. What's this president's approach? What will he do? So Ibrahim Raisi is the new president who came into power in Iran last year in a controversial election where uh, many viable competitors were actually disqualified from running by this conservative body that oversees the election. And and many Iranians essentially see him as a shoo-in candidate by the conservatives who sort of opened the way uh, for him to win the election and become the president. He's from the hard line or ultra-conservative camp. He's a clergy himself. He's vowed that the protesters would be will be met with the reaction from security forces, a recipe for a violent crackdown, as we also saw back in 2009. The similar discourse we also saw in 2019. And we are also hearing of internet disruptions, which is again another sign that a crackdown is on their way. We've already seen images of violence, but I'm just suspecting that there will be even more. 
Mm, so incredibly concerning. What happens next? It sounds to me like the government will do all it can to silence these protesters. So can these protests lead to real change there? I'm hoping that this would be a turning point, that this would be a moment, a okay, wake-up call to the authorities, because now you're also, what I find significant is that we're hearing from religious Iranians, from some religious scholars even, Grand Ayatollah even, saying that this is immoral, what the morality police is doing, this kind of violent imposition of an Islamic dress code is just not moral. He called it illegal, immoral, and irrational because it's also backfiring. It's driving young women and men away from religion instead of trying to impose what you consider a value or a virtue with this kind of violence, you're basically driving young people away from this kind of belief and faith. So if their grievances are not addressed, the next time they're just going to come back with a pile uh, and layers of this anger uh, back on the street. Mm, and Nega, as an Iranian woman, how do you feel as you watch these women and men take to the streets? Well, I grew up in Iran. I lived in Iran um, when I was a young adult. So I lived through the morality police. I completely understand as just as an average Iranian citizen, the fear and the humiliation, the disrespect of having to deal with the morality police Watching the protests from from thus far, these this young generation, much younger than me, is just incredible. I'm in awe of their bravery, of their courage, of this uh, immense maturity that they're also showing men and allies shoulder to shoulder with men fighting for their uh, equal rights, for their dignity. And I'm just hoping that it would bring change and uh, make things better so that masses death wouldn't be for nothing. Nagar Matazavi is an Iranian-American journalist and host of the Iran podcast. President Raisi has threatened a decisive strike against the protesters. Live ammunition has already reportedly been used against them. This episode was produced by Flint Duxfield, Sydney Peed and Chris Dengate, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer is Stephen Smiley. I'm Sam Hawley. ABC News Daily will be back again tomorrow. You can find all our episodes of the podcast on the ABC Listen app. To get in touch with the team, email us on abcnewsdaily at abc.net.au. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.